In a series of videos now, I want to talk about how you might build your SEN team and the range of roles that you might have within that team. Now, clearly it's a bit of a wish list if you were to employ all these people, but I think these videos can be useful for you to look at the roles that I'm saying can exist within a school and then thinking of which ones are more or less important based on the needs of children within your school, based on the size of your school, within the resources available, etc. So I'll start with in cognition and learning, and I'm going down really a centres model, where you have one person who takes overall responsibility for cognition and learning. Again, in a small school, of course, this won't be possible. In a middling school, it may be that the Senko lead is the head of one of the centres, and in a large school, this is a really good way to devolve your leadership to various people and have various people accountable for SEN outcomes. So within cognition and learning, you might have a head of centre. So that would be a teacher from any subject with a reputation for excellent outcomes for SEND. And that person, you might call them a deputy senko perhaps, but equally you could call them a head of centre with responsibility for cognition and learning. So they'd be responsible for line managing, including performance management of teaching assistants, for staff training on areas within cognition and learning, for tracking and then accelerating the progress of students with cognition and learning needs, for managing the exam access arrangements process, it's a really big job if you've done it, and leading on the delivery of interventions within cognition and learning primarily on interventions supporting literacy and numeracy most likely. You may also in your cognition and learning centre have a HLTA. So they'd be responsible for being the first port of call for TAs to go to for issues around their deployment, communication and ongoing partnership with teachers so they can take more of the day-to-day -day load, freeing up you or the head of centre if you have one, to do more of the strategic work. The HLTA can also be responsible for ensuring interventions are taking place and having the resource needed to be successful. So they're overseen perhaps by yourself or by the head of centre, but the HLTA is doing more of the day-to-day. -day. Are they taking place? Are the kids turning up? The HLTA can also be organising peer observations within the TA team, so more of the supportive part of the performance management process. And they can be ensuring that resources are maintained, so that may be from a stationary cupboard to a set of books or intervention resources that are needed. And then, of course, within your cognition and learning team, that's likely to be where your teaching assistants are deployed themselves. So the TAs would lead interventions within their area. That may be literacy, numeracy interventions, of course. It may be dyslexia interventions for students who need some extra support within either planning and sequencing, organisation or spelling, perhaps. They may also run a homework club perhaps curriculum support, provide study skills interventions. So a wide raft of things you can get your teaching assistants doing. I'll talk more about effective deployment of TAs in a separate video. With this, TAs, just to say now, you want them deployed cleverly and thoughtfully, so you'll know almost certainly about the poor evidence around the Velcro approach, and it's much better to divide them up in a way that they're leading interventions, while also becoming specialists in an area of SEND. So you might deploy them by centre, by broad area of SEN need. You might deploy them to work within a particular subject area so they can become subject specialists and or you might deploy them within a particular year or key stage. So you have a teaching assistant who works closely with year seven, for example, and gets to know that year group really well. And then within cognition and learning, think about your whole school focus, as well as what you can get out of the wider teaching and learning team. So, for example, there might be a teacher in your school who is perhaps a social sciences teacher who will have some understanding of attachment theory. So you'll then want to think about the whole school focus and what you can get from the best teachers in your school in order to improve SEN provision and teaching and learning for other areas of the school. So your best teachers in the school are likely to be the best teachers for SEND as well. Use them. You want to stop people thinking that SEND is a separate, specialist, inaccessible world. It's about teaching and learning that responds to the needs of the students in the class. So there may be a teacher who keeps their pupil profiles or their one-page summaries of need as live documents that help to impact their planning and delivery. There may be a teacher who sets really good home learning that's accessible to all. Use these people, get them to speak in a staff briefing or lead a carousel in a staff training or ask that teacher about how they can have influence within their own department area or key stage. Finally, in terms of building a team for cognition and learning, it is possible, of course, to have SEN teachers, and this seems like a great luxury, and is, of course, a great expense. The danger is, apart from the expense, 
that it furthers the idea that good practice for SEN is something that others do, not something that can be expected from all. So as a subject teacher yourself, as Senko, you're in a position to talk about what whole class teaching looks like, which is inclusive and meets the needs of all learners. I think there is the thought that, well, an SEN teacher must bring something else that the other teachers in school cannot bring, and I think that's a dangerous mindset.